Now, back live to The Kenny Report. Now, I said at the start of the show that I know many of you disagree with me when it comes to this travel ban from, uh, for Australians coming back from India. And when we get to viewer feedback uh, at the end of the show, I'll, I'll show you. I don't mind showing people disagreeing with me. I know I'm outnumbered, perhaps, on this one. But let's get to China now, and I want to catch up with the LNP member for Fairfax in Queensland, Ted O'Brien. He joins me live from Brisbane. Good to talk to you, Ted. You wrote a fantastic piece in the Australian Financial Review today on China and our problems with it. And there's one phrase that really sums it up. You're saying the days of treating security and economics as separate domains are behind us. And, and that gets to a nutshell of where we're at at the moment, doesn't it? For so long, we thought we could develop this economic relationship with China and still uh, leave the strategic issues to one side. Now they're intrinsically linked. Indeed, Chris, and great to be with you again. It, you know, it doesn't matter if it's Australia or if you look at any other liberal democracy across the world. We seem to separate government politics from economics and business. Um, of course, they, they interconnect here and there. But when you compare our system that purposely tries to avoid government being mixed up with business, compare that to China, where really... Um, politics and economics are being steered by the one hand, and that hand being the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, y you start to realise why communist China um, is using economics as a tool of statecraft and why the economic coercion being inflicted on Australia now is in fact, in fact using economics with a view to achieving geostrategic outcomes for the communist regime. That's well, the problem. There's no doubt that it's economic warfare. China is deliberately hurting us economically in order to punish us for things we've done in our own national interests, even things we've said in our own national interests. Now, interestingly, you propose that there are ways that we, together with like-minded countries, some of our allies, other Western liberal democracies, can fight back. And you're saying effectively that we ought to have each other's economic backs to to help bail each other out when China costs us money or to at least promise some sort of retribution together. Isn't that... A, couldn't that escalate the situation? Oh, anything can escalate a situation if not managed well, Chris. There's no doubt about that. The point I'm making is simply this. When it comes to issues of defence, military security, we adopt, we embrace a principle of collective security and mutual assistance. But we don't do that with our allies when it comes to economic attack, which I believe is one of the reasons why China continues to use economics as a, stu as a tool of statecraft, because we do not respond collectively. When no, we, we do, China we blinks. In a, when in a we do, sense, we're competitors rather than allies when it comes to economics, right? E e exactly. And we don't want to change the, the liberal order that we have, including free market economics. But this is what China does, though. Um, they, might, uh, they might bump up tariffs, pushing down, let's say, barley from Australia, and Canada wins. And then the next year, it might be Canada loses, Australia wins. And what we have is this built-in divide and conquer um, strategy of China, which is why we need to start talking with liberal democracies and other like-minded nations about how we can collectively respond when one of our number is under economic attack, whether it be from communist China or any other regime. Because unless we do, then we will continue to see um, uh, China adopt those measures. Um, they are effectively using our own values against us and we need to act. Very difficult to do. For instance, you could have China not buying Australian lamb and you, 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 you need to say to New Zealand, Instead of you selling more lamb now, what you need to do is withhold your lamb, not make extra money at the expense of our trade sanctions. It's a, it's, it goes against everything we Chris, stand for. I don't think, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that's the way it should be done. I don't, I'm not talking here about mass boycotts. Um, once you start going down that path, you're talking about the complete decoupling of economies. I don't believe that's the solution to China. Um, let me put it in a different way to you. Um, anyone who thinks that the measures we are being inflicted, the trade measures by China, is all about a bilateral um, tit-for-tat trade war, it's not. Um, China is doing this 
as part of a global game. Unless we respond globally, then we're going to have troubles. And the key player um, in this is no the US. We I... need the US economy to defend Indeed. us. We are singled Indeed. out partly because we're uh, a US the... ally, so we need the US to respond as well. Absolutely. And as soon as the US stood up last month before the meetings in Alaska to China and said very clearly, you are adopting economic measures against Australia that will not be tolerated, China backed off. They backed off immediately, albeit only for a couple of weeks. Once those meetings were over, they were back into business. So they do blink once we stand as a united force. How we do it is riddled with complication, but we must put it on the agenda as we deepen our relationship with allies. We have to make sure we are very plain in our speaking that China is using economics as a tool. We must work out how we respond collectively. Just very briefly, Ted O'Brien, last year, the UK and the US had daily infection rates three times what we're now seeing in India, yet we didn't ban Australians coming home from those countries. Why India? Well, all we can do, Chris, is take on the advice from our chief medical officer. Um, the advice is that the, the risk is higher and thus the, um, the measures we introduce have to be more risk averse. Um, this is a temporary two week um, measure. Um, now, please God, things will improve um, and um, we can ensure that repatriation continues. But right, look, thank... first and foremost, we need to keep people safe. Thanks so much for joining us, Ted. I appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks, Chris. Ted O'Brien there, live from Brisbane. Uh, dab a hand on China. Some interesting ideas there. Now, quickly, some of your reaction to what I've been saying about India. And Lacey says, one of the richest economies in the world with massive navy and space and rocket ability can't look after their own people. How sad. Well, they're not one of the richest nations in the world on a per capita basis, that's for sure. Megan says, how is the fifth richest country in the world not able to provide essential medical care to its citizens? Well, again, India is a developing country and has a massive population. Paulie says all countries must act by closing their borders to all flights from India immediately because these infected people must not be allowed to get back to Australia by airport hopping. We have hotel quarantine. No one gets in without 14 days quarantine. And just finally, Mark Cooper says we'd better get our quarantine facilities in order then. That's the reason the flights needed to cease. Well, as I said, our hotel, quar hotel quarantine a record is there. It's been good and uh, we should continue to use it and increase and improve it if we can. Thanks for joining me. It's good to be back in a moment. Peter Credden in the chair in Credden. See you tomorrow.